First thing I should say that I'm not the chair of this panel. Ella is the moderator and chair. I am just an ordinary panelist. And I'm here to talk about a book that I've nearly finished writing um, under the title Three Worlds, memoir, a, uh, me a Memoir of an Arab Jew. And the book deals with my early life up to the age of 18. Uh, the first phase is 1945 to 1950 in Baghdad. The second phase is Israel from the age of um, 5 to 15. And the third phase is school in London from the age of uh, 15 until uh, 19 and uh, until 18. This is not so much an autobiography as a family history. And only part one of this memoir is relevant to this panel on uh, memories, memoirs, and history. The part that goes up to 1950. I had great inhibitions in embarking on this project because I found it easy to write about Middle East history. I wrote a biography of King Hussein of Jordan, but I'd never written about myself. Uh, until I read the book by Orit Bashkin, The New Babylonians, it's um, on the history of the Jews of Iraq. It's a book that combines very profound scholarship with empathy for the Jews of Iraq. I learned a huge amount from reading her book, and it gave me the idea of how to go about writing my memoir, which is to place the history of my family within the broader social and political con and cultural context of uh, the Jews of Iraq. Uh, another source of inspiration has been Ella Shohet. Um, I was influenced by her groundbreaking um, work on the subject of this conference. Uh, I also share her critique of the Eurocentric view of the history of the Jews of the Arab world. And in particular, I was influenced by her last book on the Arab Jew, Palestine, and other displacements. At the back of my mind, I, I should say first that every uh, transition in my life involved learning a new language and adjusting to a new society. So at the back of my mind, I have the Ella title for my book, which is Linguistic Landscapes and the Emotional Cartography of Displacement. The main source for this book, particularly the early part to do with Baghdad, is my mother, Masouda or Saida um, Obadia. She's 95 years old and she lives in Ramad Gan, um, and she has a most phenomenal memory, and I've interviewed her endlessly over the last three years. Uh, this is my mother, Masouda Obadia, and this is my father, uh, Yusef Shlaim. In 1942, their wedding, she was 17 years old and he was 42 years old. It was an arranged marriage and he was an extremely wealthy and successful uh, merchant with a very high social status. Also in this picture, the man in uniform is my maternal uncle, Isaac, or to give him his full name, Sach Shalom Meir Obadia. In English, there is expression for something that is very easy and, and Bob's your uncle. In my case, it's Sach Shalom Meir Obadia is your uncle. <laughs> 
the whole of my mother's side of the family had British passports. This is because her father was an interpreter for the British forces in Iraq, so he had British uh, citizenship. And her two brothers, Isaac and Saleh, became officers in British intelligence, but they are not really military people, they were essentially interpreters. Um, Isaac went to the Allianz School for Boys in Baghdad, where, um, and he was a Jew, of course, and the Jews generally were well educated uh, and knew uh, languages. That's why he was recruited into the British Army to become an interpreter. I mention this because uh, the British, who were extremely important in inventing Iraq, uh, British colonialism is a very important context for understanding the history of Iraq. The British preferred minorities, both Jews and Christians, because they were less likely to become ardent Arab nationalists or Iraqi nationalists. And the British also played the imperial game of divide and rule. And as a result, Muslims tended to associate the Jews with, with the British, which was a cause for resentment. Uh, my mother also went to the Alliance School for Girls, and she learned four languages there, French, English, Arabic, and Hebrew, and everything was taught through the medium of French. And if anyone dares suggest to her that she is dementing, she would declaim Archimedes law in French. I once asked her, what is your identity? And she said to me, I am 100% Iraqi. But because I'm also British, I have that little bit extra which the other Iraqis don't have. We were Arab Jews. We spoke Arabic at home. Our culture was Arab culture. My parents' music was both Arabic and Jewish music. I know that the term Arab Jew is very controversial in Israel. Some people say, if you are a Jew, you can't be an Arab. And if you are an Arab, you cannot be a Jew. Uh, I beg to differ. For the first five years of my life, there is no better definition of my identity than that of an Arab Jew or an Iraqi Jew. We were also well integrated into Iraqi society. There was no clash of cultures and there was no clash of civilizations. In a sense, my book is a refutation of um, Samuel Huntington's thesis about clash of civilizations. The cause of conflict in Iraq was not cultural. It was political. We had no difficulty in communicating with our Muslim neighbors, and there was no cultural impediment to cooperation. The real problem was political, and more specifically, the rise of nationalism after the First World War, Arab nationalism on the one hand, but more particularly the rise of Jewish nationalism, of Zionism. It's the rise of nationalism that made, and especially the record of um, Zionism in Palestine, in the taking, takeover of Palestine, that made coexistence between Jews and Muslims more, much more difficult, if not impossible. My family had no Zionist sympathies. We knew very little about Israel and nothing about the Zionist movement. My mother you always used to talk to me about our really good Muslim friends. One day I asked her, did we also have Zionist friends in Baghdad? 
she said to me, no, Zionism is an Ashkenazi thing. It's nothing to do with us. Yet, in 1950, my family and I moved to Israel. It wasn't an easy move or a move of our own choice. The family was split down the middle. My mother wanted to, to leave. My father, who was an Iraqi uh, and only spoke Arabic, he didn't speak Hebrew or English, wanted to stay. But my mother said it's no longer safe for the children to stay in Baghdad, and so we left. We left not all together as a family, but my mother, her mother, my two sisters and I went on her British passport on a regular flight from Baghdad to Cyprus. And from there we went, continued by boat to Haifa. Uh, my father tried to realize as much of his assets as possible, which was very little. He lost most of his fortune and he had to leave Iraq uh, illegally uh, with the help of the Kurds across the border into Iran. And then he, about a year, a year and a half later, after a very harrowing journey, he joined us in Israel and he never really recovered from this upheaval. In Israel, he was a broken man. So why did we leave Iraq if we were so happy there, so well integrated? The short answer is that in 1950-51, five bombs exploded in Jewish buildings in Baghdad. And chapter five of my memoir is called The Baghdad Bombshell. This is a combination of family history, what happened to various members of my family and extended family in 1950, but it's also the story of um, what happened to the community in general. So the sequence of events was that in March 1950, the Iraqi government passed a law which said that any Iraqi Jew who wants to leave the country is free to do so, they have a year to register and to get a one-way uh, visa, no return to Iraq. There were around 138,000 Jews in Iraq. Around 6,000 people exercised this option and registered to leave. Then there was a series of bombs um, and there have always this has been much written about and there have been persistent rumors that Israel had a hand in these bombs. Israel always denied any involvement. There have been two commissions of inquiry which cleared Israel of any responsibility for these bombs. Um, Mordechai ben Parat and Shlomo Hillel, the two main organizers of the airlift to Israel, Operation Ezra and Nehemia, as it was called, to this day deny any Israeli involvement. But in the course of researching this book, I've come across some new evidence which suggests that Israel was responsible for four of the bombs and may have been responsible for the fifth one. The fifth one isn't in sequence, but it's an, uh, the odd one out. The fifth bomb was the hand grenade lobbed into the Masoud Hashem Tob synagogue, which killed four people. All the other bombs were terrorist bombs to frighten people um, and to get them to, to go to Israel. But in this bomb, four people were killed because the hand grenade hit an electricity cable uh, and that's, that was uh, responsible, that resulted in, in casualties. Now, the new evidence that I have comes from 
a friend of my mother's who lives in Ramat Gan. He's 91 years old, and he was a member of the Zionist underground. And he told me the story in detail. Um, uh, very briefly, he described how a group of them operated to organize the illegal and then the legal immigration aliyah to Israel. And he said that one of the members, Yosef Basri, who was a very smart Jewish lawyer, was responsible for four of the bonds. He didn't tell him or the others, he operated on his own. And um, his operator, according to this friend, was Max Binet, a Mossad officer who was based in Tehran. At the trial of uh, Yosef Basri, the evidence against him was produced. Traces of explosives were found in his car. He was condemned, tried, condemned, and hanged. When I recorded, uh, on a subsequent occasion, I recorded the interview with his friend, he said to me suddenly, the fifth bomb was also ours, and you could have knocked me down with a feather. And I asked him how, and he said, the Zionist underground bribed an Ira a Baghdad chief of police, and this chief of police got a criminal, a Syrian criminal, he gave me his name, who was in prison, and he had a grudge against the Jews. He gave him the hand grenade, and he lobbed the hand grenade. Now, this is oral history, uh, and I asked this friend whether he had any written evidence, and eventually he produced an Ira a Baghdad police report which confirmed all these details. It gave names, name names, and gave details of the bombs. And Basri was never charged of responsibility for the fifth bomb. This would explain why he was not charged, because he wasn't responsible for the fifth uh, uh, bomb. This um, police report is undated, there is no letterhead, and there is no uh, title, and it's not signed. So I wouldn't claim that this is the smoking gun, but it's a piece of evidence. And taken together with the oral testimony of the friend, and all the circumstantial evidence, uh, I believe this account. It all adds up to Israeli involvement in the bombs that, that instigated the um, mass exodus to Israel. Overall, before this, um, the law was passed, there were 138,000 Jews. By 1951, 120,000 Jews had left, mostly for Israel. My conclusion is that we are not Zionists. We did not choose to move from Baghdad to Israel. We were forcibly conscripted into the Zionist project. Most Jews who ended up in Israel ended in transit camps in Marbarot. And that's another story, and I believe that Orit works now on what happened to the Jews who arrived uh, in Israel. Some Jews, Iraqi Jews, did better than others in Israel. But for the community as a whole, the experience was like that of a tree which is uprooted from its roots. Someone once coined the term cruel Zionism. And this is a clear instance of cruel Zionism. 
My own academic discipline is international relations, and I've written quite a lot about the Arab-Israeli conflict and about the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. And everyone knows that the main victims of the Zionist project are the Palestinians. In 1948, three quarters of a million Palestinians became refugees. In 1967, another quarter of a million Palestinians became refugees, some of them a second time. But there is a second category of victims of Zionism, and that is the Jews of the Arab lands. Uh, it is arguable, although I'm not going to argue today, that there is a link between the two categories, that in 1948, Israel carried out the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, and after that, Israel did everything to instigate mass immigration to Israel from anywhere possible, from Eastern Europe, anywhere possible, including the um, Arab countries. So my um, memoir illustrates the impact of Zionism on my family and by extension on the Jewish community in Iraq. My account contradicts the standard Zionist rendition of events. The, the Zionist narrative says that the Jews of Iraq faced the danger of a second Holocaust. And the infant state of, infant state of Israel came to the rescue and offered them a safe haven. I searched very hard for evidence that this was the motive to help to rescue the Jews of Iraq, but I couldn't find any. Uh, the dominant consideration behind this move was the interests of the state of Israel. This experience was not unique. It was part of a pattern of Zionist activity. Uh, before the Jews of Iraq, the, there was the Aliyah of the Jews of Yemen, and subsequently there was the Jews of Morocco who ended up, ended up in Israel. Martin Gilbert published a book called The House, In the House of Ishmael, the Jews in the Arab lands. This is a very shallow and superficial book which puts forward the Zionist narrative of events. There is no analysis there. He doesn't tackle the really deep issues in the relationship between Muslims and Jews. His book is a catalog of anti-Semitic incidents over the ages from Afghanistan to Morocco. So my summing up of this book is that it's an instance of the distortion of Muslim-Jewish relations at the service of Zionist propaganda. My aim in, uh, my aim in writing this book is to set the record straight at least as far as my family is concerned. Uh, this panel is about memories, memoirs, and history. Only the th first third of my memoir is relevant to this panel. So what I've tried to tell you uh, is some of the things that I've learned about th the life and the history of the Jews of Iraq and the reasons behind the mass exodus to Israel. Thank you.